Discrimination. Discrimination on the grounds of race, sex and religion are all now discredited. But discrimination on the ground of nationality is written into the laws of every land. Theodore Zeldin. Today, today's lecture is going to be about the UK system of immigration laws. What are immigration laws? Where did they come from? Why do we have them? And do we need them? This subject means a great deal to me. I am a black British person who was born in London in 1965. My family came to the UK from Antigua and Dominica as part of the Windrush generation. The story I will be telling in this lecture is interwoven with my own family story. As we will be exploring in this lecture the, the story of British immigration laws from the 1960s to the present day, this has been in la a large part a story about race and racism. We're going to trace the history of the history of immigration control from the early 20th century to today. We're going to situate it in a social, political, and economic context. And we're going to examine the arguments in favor of restricting immigration and see whether they actually stack up. I want to dedicate this lecture to my late colleague, Ian MacDonald of Queen's Council, who died in 2019. Ian was a giant of the bar. Called to the bar in 1963, he defended immigrants, fought racism throughout his long career. Amidst the heightened racism of the 60s and 70s, he fearlessly stood up for the oppressed and marginalized. He pioneered the field of migrants' rights advocacy as we know it today. His book, MacDonald on Immigration Law and Practice, is now in its 10th edition. I'm proud to call Ian my colleague and my friend. I also want to introduce a guest for this lecture, David Neal. David is a legal researcher at Garden Court Chambers. He previously practiced as a barrister, specializing in immigration law from 2014 to 2017. He's an expert in all areas of immigration, asylum and nationality law and is the co-editor of the current 10th edition of MacDonald Immigration Law and Practice. He's also an assistant consultant editor of the British Nationality Volume of Holsbury's Laws of England and a contributor to Butterworth's Immigration Law Service. And he writes regularly for the Legal Action magazine. He regularly delivers training on immigration and asylum law. Now, this lecture is going to be in three parts. First, I want to talk about the development of British immigration law from the 60s to today. Then David will talk about the immigration and asylum system. And finally, I will come back with a few thoughts on the politics and the policy of immigration. Before we talk about the history of British immigration laws, I'd like to define what we mean by immigration laws. Immigration laws are laws which restrict the entry and stay of non-citizens. Generally speaking, in international law, countries can't restrict the entry and stay of its own citizens. Although there are some important exceptions to this, which we will be discussing later. So immigration law is intertwined with nationality law. In general, if you're a citizen, you have the right to live in the country um, and you're not subject to the immigration laws of the country where, where you uh, are from. Whereas, if you are non-citizen, you are subject to immigration laws and you need permission of the country to enter and stay. So, the concept of nationality is fundamental to immigration law. 
Now, I realize that this all sounds very obvious, but it's important to define our terms carefully because there are other legal restrictions on cross-border movement that are not immigration laws in this, in this sense. For example, during the current COVID um, pandemic, most countries have required people arriving into their country to quarantine and take PCR tests. This is not an immigration law as I am using the term because it applies to citizens and non-citizens equally. It isn't based on nationality. So we aren't going to be talking about that type of law today. We're going to be talking about immigration laws in the strict sense, laws that restrict the entry and stay of non-citizens. So, with this definition in mind, let's talk about the history of British immigration law. In order to talk about immigration law, we have to talk about nationality law because the two are fundamentally intertwined. Britain first introduced controls on immigration in the in 1905, but for the first half of the 20th century, those controls only applied to people who were aliens, that is, people who were not British subjects. At that time, Britain had a vast empire that spanned much of the world and hundreds of millions of people, and many of the people born in Britain's colonies abroad were British subjects. There were some exceptions to this because some of Britain's territories were protectorates rather than colonies. And, British, and people born in British protectorates were not always British subjects, but they had a different nationality status called British protected persons. So on the eve of the Second World War, we had two types of British nationality, British subjects and British protected persons. After the Second World War, however, a lot changed. First, some of the white majority British territories abroad, such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, had been steadily becoming more independent. They had gained a measure of political independence before the war with the 1931 Statute of Westminster. They were no longer just British colonies. At the time, they were known as the Dominions. Secondly, there were growing independence movements in some of British Britain's colonies abroad. As most people know, India became independent from the British Empire on the 15th of August, 1947. During the following decades, a lot of other colonies achieved independence. Some of them kept the queen as the head of state, while others became republics. Against this backdrop, the UK Parliament passed the British Nationality Act, 1948. This divided British subjects into two new statuses, people from the UK, and its remaining colonies were called citizens of the UK and colonies, or CUKCs. People from the newly independent Commonwealth countries were not CUKCs, but had the new status of Commonwealth citizen. However, both CUKCs and Commonwealth citizens continue to enjoy the legal right to live and work in the UK. In short, Britain had open borders for people from the Commonwealth. And something else was happening at the same time. Large numbers of black and Asian people from the British Empire were coming to Britain to help rebuild Britain after the war. Nowadays, this group of people are often known as the Windrush generation after the ship HMT Empire Windrush, which docked in Britain on the 22nd of June, 1948, bringing people from the Caribbean. However, a turning point came in 1962. 
The Commonwealth Immigra Immigrants Act 1962 introduced controls on immigration from the Commonwealth for the first time. Now, in order to understand why it happened, we have to talk about race and racism. At the outset of the 1960s, racial tensions about immigration were running high. As most people know, this was a time where landlords and businesses would display signs such as no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. And racism was influential in Parliament too. Some MPs, such as the Conservative backbencher Norman um, Pennell and Cyril Osborne, were vocal opponents of black and Asian immigration from the Commonwealth. The Conservative government of Harold Macmillan came under political pressure. Following a spike in immigration numbers in 1960 and 1961, the government introduced the Commonwealth Immigra Immig Immigrants Act. This piece of legislation was directly designed to control immigration of black and Asian people from the Commonwealth. It imposed immigration controls on Commonwealth citizens who were not CUKCs. It also imposed controls on CUKCs who had a passport issued in a British colony rather than in the UK. The 1962 Act didn't silence the anti-immigration movement. Many of you have heard of the 1964 um, um, Smethwick by-election widely regarded as the most racist election in British history. Supporters of the Conservative candidate openly used the slogan containing, containing a racial slur. If you want a N-word for a neighbour, vote Labour. Racial tensions were running high. Those racial tensions were stoked by politicians of the time, such as Enoch Powell, who is most remembered for delivering the racially inflammatory Rivers of Blood speech in 1968. In the late 60s, Asians from Kenya and Uganda, many of whom were CUKCs with British passports, began to arrive in Britain, fleeing governments which were hostile to them. The government reacted. By then, a Labour government was in power, led by the, British, the Prime Minister Harold Wilson, with future Prime Minister James Callaghan as Home Secretary. If you were expecting Labour to be less racist than the Conservatives, you'd be disappointed. Callaghan introduced the Commonwealth Immigrants Act of 1968 with the aim of excluding East African Asians from the UK. The 1968 Act expanded the scope of controls that had been established by the 1962 Act. Controls were now imposed on any CUKC unless they or one of their parents or grandparents was born, adopted, naturalised or re registered as a citizen of the United Kingdom. So, CUKCs with recent UK ancestry, most of whom were white, remained free from immigration control, while CUKCs from British colonies, most of whom were black and Asian, were subject to controls. Its immediate impact is that the East African Asians, unable to return to Kenya or Uganda, and unable to settle in Britain, were left with no home at all. In public, Callaghan denied that the act was racist, but cabinet papers released in the late 1990s shows that he was lying. In a confidential memo, the cabinet secretary, Sir Burke Trent, suggested that, quote, the Asian community in East Africa are not nationals of this country in any racial sense, close quote. 
A startling racist memo written by Callahan himself exposes his thinking was racist from start to finish. He said, and I quote, it is sometimes argued that we can take a less serious view of the, of the scale of immigration and settlement in this country because it could be and currently is being more than offset by total emigration. This view overlooks the important point that emigration is largely by white persons from nearly every corner of the United Kingdom, while immigration and settlement are largely by coloured persons into a relatively small number of concentrated areas. The exchange thus aggravates rather than alleviates the problem." End of quote. In the same memo, he admitted that, and I quote, I decided to legislate to slow down Asian immigration from East Africa. End of quote. So let's not mince words. The 1968 Act was a racist act enacted for racist reasons. And that is not just my opinion. In 1973, the European Commission on Human Rights, as it then was, gave a judgment in the case of East African Asians against the United Kingdom. It found not only that the 1968 Act was racially discriminatory, but also that it violated Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, in that it constituted degrading treatment. That is a very extreme finding, but in the circumstances, a fully justified one. The government supposedly remedied this injustice by creating a scheme called the Special Quota Voucher Scheme that allowed some CUKCs to settle in the UK based on an annual quota. But the racist framework of controls established by the 1968 Act remained in place. In 1971, Parliament consolidated immigration law into a new act, the Immigration Act 1971. This act is still in force and remains the fundamental basis of British immigration law. To this day, it came into force on the 1st of January 1973. The 1971 Act created a single system of controls for aliens and Commonwealth citizens for the first time and it introduced the concept of patriality. People who were patrials had the right of abode, that is, the absolute right to live in the UK, while people who were non patrials did not. Non patrials required leave to enter and leave to remain, and these concepts remain the basis of UK immigration law today. So who is a patrial? CUKCs who were born, naturalised, adopted or registered as citizens in the UK, the Channel Islands or Isle of Man, or who had a parent or grandparent who was, were patrials. Commonwealth citizens who had a parent born in the UK were also patrials. So you can see that the racist criteria of the 1968 Act were carried over to the 1971 Act. CUKCs, um, with UK ancestry, who were mostly white, were given the right of abode, while CUKCs without UK ancestry were not. Some CUKCs who had lived here for five years or more were patrials, but the vast majority of black and Asian people from the Commonwealth were subjected to controls, even if they were CUKCs who, who held British passports. So, you can see that by the early 1970s, we had an unusual disconnect, where there were large numbers of people who were UK citizens with UK passports, but who had no right to live in the UK. This defied the normal international law principles that countries cannot exclude its own citizens. 
In the meantime, another change was taking place. Through the 1960s and 70s, most of Britain's colonies became independent. And typically, when a colony became independent, most of its people lost their status as CUKCs. They remained Commonwealth citizens, but as we've seen, CUKCs were treated more favorably than Commonwealth citizens by 1962, 1968, and the 1971 Acts. This meant that some people lost their right to live in the UK without even realizing it. In most cases, people from a colony kept their CUKC status if their father or paternal grandfather was born in the UK or remain in colony. So again, people with UK ancestry who were mostly white were treated more favorably. The next big change was the British Nationality Act 1981, which brought nationality law into line with immigration law. CUKCs, who were patriots, were renamed British citizens. non patrial CUKCs became British overseas citizens or British dependent territories citizens. There are still a lot of British overseas citizens around today. And uh, they still do not enjoy an automatic right to live in the UK. So Britain still defies international law principles that all citizens have the right to live in their own country. Another change made by the 1981 Act, which continues to cause massive problems today, was the abolition of birthright citizenship. Before 1981 Act, Generally speaking, everyone born in the UK was a CUKC, regardless of the status of their parents. There were a couple of exceptions, such as children born to foreign diplomats. But generally speaking, being born in Britain meant you were British. And lots of people assume this is still the case, but it isn't. Children born in the UK are only British if one of their parents is British or has the right to live in the UK permanently. For this reason, many children born in the UK today are not legally British, although British-born children normally have the right to register as British after the age of 10. High home office fees shut many children out because British, out from British citizenship until recent litigation forced the Home Office to change its stance. This has been a whistle-stop tour of the history of immigration and nationality law. We haven't covered all the other arbitrary restrictions, such as the fact that children of unmarried British fathers were shut out from British citizenship for a long time. But there are two messages I think we can draw from this story. The first message is that nationality is arbitrary. It's an accident of birth. Your nationality depends on when you were born, where you were born, and who your parents are. Discrimination based on nationality is just as unjust as discrimination based on race, gender, or any other similar characteristic. But while we have laws that seek to combat race, and gender discrimination, our laws explicitly embrace dis discrimination based on nationality. Indeed, we have a whole government department whose purpose is to control the entry and stay of non-citizens, backed up by the violence of detention and enforced removal. The second message is that British immigration law is rooted in racism. It was created because of racism, and it exists today because of racism. The racist foundations of the 1962 and 68 Acts were carried over into the 1971 Act, and the 1971 Act is still the basis of our immigration law today. Racism is baked into the very foundations of our immigration law. Now, I'm going to hand over to David to talk about how the immigration system impacts people today.
I'm going to talk about the various forms of protection that are available in immigration law for people who are at risk of suffering harm in their home countries. I'm going to critically examine the UK's claim that it protects refugees through its asylum system. I'm going to talk about the inadequacy of asylum law as a system of protection and the brutality and cruelty that our asylum system frequently inflicts on genuine refugees. I'm also going to look at the protection that our immigration law affords for private and family life and how in practice our immigration law tears families apart. We're going to be talking about three main forms of protection, asylum, humanitarian protection and the European Convention on Human Rights. So we're going to start with asylum. Most people have a general understanding of what the words asylum and refugee mean, but there's a lot of misconceptions about it. So the concepts of asylum and refugee status as we know them today come from the 1951 Refugee Convention, a treaty which was signed in the aftermath of the Second World War. Many nations, including the UK and the various EU countries, are signed up to the Refugee Convention and apply it as part of their immigration law. Now the convention lays down a basic definition of a refugee. The definition is a little bit wordy, but the key part is this. A refugee is a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality, and is unable, or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. So what this means in practice, when a person claims to be a refugee, which is also known as claiming asylum, there are several things they have to prove to the authorities in order to be recognized as a refugee. First, they have to prove that they have a well-founded fear of being persecuted in their home country. Second, they have to prove that the persecution is because of one of the five convention reasons, their race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. Third, if the persecution is from non-state actors, they have to prove that their home country's authorities, their home country's government and police and courts, wouldn't adequately protect them against it. Fourth, they have to prove that they couldn't avoid the persecution by relocating to another part of their home country. And that last criterion involves asking, firstly, could they avoid the persecution by relocating? And second, would it be reasonable for them to do so? In some cases, there are also added complexities. For example, some people are excluded from refugee status because of their past crimes. Um, but those are the general principles. That's the basic definition of what a refugee is. So what I want to talk about now is some things that the Refugee Convention does not do. First, it does not provide refugees with a safe and legal route to reach a safe country. In general, in order to claim asylum in the UK, you have to already be in the UK. You can't claim asylum from your home country. And the likelihood is that you can't come to the UK legally without a visa. The UK imposes mandatory visa requirements on most of the countries from which refugees come, and airlines are penalized if they let people travel without a visa. A small number of refugees are resettled under resettlement schemes, but the vast majority have no choice but to leave their country through irregular means. That leaves people with basically two choices. First, if they have the money and the resources to do so, they can get a visa to a safe country under false pretenses and then claim asylum when they arrive. In order to do that, they have no choice but to conceal their true intentions. Or if they don't have the ability to do that, which most people don't, their only option is to cross borders illegally, such as in the back of a lorry or on a small boat. This is often very dangerous and many people die. Other people are pushed into the hands of human traffickers who exploit them. What I want to emphasize is that most people in this position have no choice because there are, for most people, no safe and legal routes to reach a safe country. In many cases, it's a choice between escaping your country illegally or staying and being killed and tortured. And of course, many people never manage to escape at all. Now, the Home Office often tells us that people shouldn't enter Britain through irregular means because they should have claimed asylum in France or Italy or another European country. But this, I'm afraid, ignores the complexity of real human lives. In some European countries, many asylum seekers are street homeless and destitute. In some, they face hostility from right-wing governments and brutality from racist police. And some asylum seekers have family in the UK, parents, spouses, children, siblings, and have an understandable wish to be reunited with their loved ones, rather than being left alone in an unfamiliar and hostile country. 
In short, there are lots of good reasons why a person might need to travel onwards rather than claiming in the first country they arrive in. And if you feel entitled to sit in judgment on asylum seekers who cross the channel, and just ask yourself whether you'd be happy if your own child or partner or sibling was sleeping on the streets in a European city, surviving by begging, being beaten by police, and living in fear. And ask yourself whether you'd break the law to ensure that they were able to come here and live with you. I think that we all know the answer. So, another thing the Refugee Convention doesn't do. The Refugee Convention doesn't protect a lot of the people who need protection. Because as we've just heard, the legal definition of a refugee is quite narrow. You have to have a well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of your race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. So contrary to what you might assume, a person who's at risk of imminent death because their country is a war zone and they're being bombed isn't necessarily a refugee in law. They might be, but they might not be. Nor is a person living in a famine-struck country who is watching their children starve to death. Nor is a person who is dying of a treatable illness because they're too poor to afford treatment. And that's, that's something we're going to come back to. So the, these are all lacunae, these are all gaps in the protection provided by the Refugee Convention. There's a lot of people who have an urgent humanitarian need to, to settle in a safe country and who are not protected by the Refugee Convention. Now, nowadays, the UK does have some forms of protection that are complementary to refugee status. Uh, the first of those is called humanitarian protection, which is an invention of EU law. Um, in other EU countries, it's called subsidiary protection. Uh, you can get humanitarian protection if you're someone who's at risk of serious harm in your home country, such as the death penalty or torture, but it's not for one of the five convention reasons. So if you're at risk of serious harm for some reason other than those five convention reasons, you, you can qualify for humanitarian protection. In some circumstances, you can also get humanitarian protection if you're at risk from indiscriminate violence because your country is a war zone. But the threshold for this kind of protection, which we call Article 15C protection, is very high. For example, for many years, up until the recent takeover by the Taliban, the UK has never accepted that there is enough indiscriminate violence in Kabul to meet the Article 15C threshold, despite there being regular bombings and high levels of violence there. Nor did it accept that there was enough indiscriminate violence in Baghdad to meet the threshold, even at the height of the war against Islamic State. Nor does it accept that there is enough indiscriminate violence in Mogadishu to meet the threshold. So time and time, from the comfort of their desks, British officials and British judges have decided that Kabul, Baghdad, and Mogadishu are safe enough to return people to. You might well ask whether they'd be happy to send their own children there. And again, I think we all know the answer. We also have Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, um, which prohibits inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Now, there's a number of circumstances in which Article 3 might come into play in immigration law. Uh, one of those, for example, is if a person is at risk of serious harm on return, such as death or torture, um, but they're excluded from refugee status and humanitarian protection because of past crimes. Um, because Article 3, unlike refugee status and humanitarian protection, is, is absolute. It doesn't depend on, or it doesn't depend on whether you've, you've, you've committed crimes. Um, but Article 3 can also come into play at times when a person is critically ill and would die from, on return from lack of health care. As we've heard, that's, that's a, a, a type of person that is not protected by the Refugee Convention. And we're going to examine this a little bit because it's one of the most controversial areas of immigration law. And I think it tells us a lot about, uh, about what is at the heart of British immigration law. So this line of case law began with the case of Dee and United Kingdom in 1997, where the European Court of Human Rights held that it was a breach of Article 3 to deport a critically ill HIV sufferer to St. Kitts, where he was going to die early in degrading conditions with no access to care, support, or accommodation. So yeah, that's a good decision. But the next chapter in the story, unfortunately, is the 2005 House of Lords decision in N where our most senior judges, including one of our most celebrated judges, Baroness Hale, held that it was not a breach of Article 3 to forcibly return a Ugandan rape survivor with HIV to a country where she would die a painful death due to the unavailability of antiretroviral drugs. 
The House of Lords distinguished the case of Dee and confined it to its own narrow facts, where Dee was already terminally ill and would have lacked the services necessary to prevent acute suffering while he was dying. So, having lost in the House of Lords, Anne took her case to Strasbourg, and she lost in the case of Anne and United Kingdom. And this precedent was a death sentence for many sick and disabled migrants for a decade. And unfortunately, this, this fairly horrifying line of case law reached its zenith with the 2015 Court of Appeal case of GS and EO, which held that it was lawful to forcibly return people with late-stage kidney failure in circumstances where they would receive no treatment on return and would die soon and painfully. Now, this line of case law has now been mitigated by the 2016 European Court of Human Rights decision in Papochvili and Belgium, which widened the doctrine laid down in N. Under Papochvili, a person can resist removal under Article 3, even if they're not at imminent risk of dying, if the lack of appropriate treatment on return would give rise to a real risk that they would suffer a serious, rapid, or irreversible decline in their state of health, resulting in intense suffering or a significant reduction in life expectancy. And this was finally adopted by our Supreme Court, again, to be fair, including Baroness Hale, in the 2020 case of AM Zimbabwe. So yeah, that's a glimmer of hope for a lot of people. But I want to dwell on the end decision for a while and what it tells us about our society. If, if someone wanted to defend the decision, it's easy for them to say that the House of Lords is just applying the law as it stood. They're just judges. They're not, not political actors. But I think that analysis is completely wrong. N was a decision at the cutting edge of the law. The House of Lords had a real choice about whether to extend the principle in D or whether to confine it narrowly to its facts. They made a decision to do the latter. They made a policy decision, in effect. And it's very clear from the judgments that the argument that hung heavily on their minds was floodgates. Um, the idea that a decision in N's favour would impose on Britain an obligation to treat unlimited numbers of AIDS sufferers from all over the world. Lord Hope of Craighead said, it would risk drawing into the United Kingdom large numbers of people already suffering from HIV in the hope that they too could remain here indefinitely so that they could take the benefit of the medical resources that are available in this country. So that, that's, that's a political policy consideration, in effect. Public policy considerations underlay the decision in N. And ultimately, we have to remember that, especially in these cutting-edge cases, judges are political actors. They're not neutral arbiters of the law. They make value-driven decisions every day, pitting different values against one another. And when we step back and we, look, um, and we leave behind the legal jargon and we look at the end decision through a social rather than a legal lens, it says a lot about Britain that a group of white, privileged, comfortable Supreme Court judges felt that they were entitled to send a critically ill black woman to her death because she wasn't British. And if the European court hadn't acted to change the position, I, don't, I doubt our courts ever would have done. So I want to return to the asylum system now and talk about another problem with it, namely how decision makers assess whether an asylum claim is credible. When a person claims asylum, one of the things they normally have to prove is that their account is credible. That is, that they're telling the truth about what happened to them. And the reality is that many people are disbelieved. Many asylum seekers recount the most traumatic events in their lives only to be accused of lying by the Home Office. And the reasons why the Home Office disbelieves people are usually spurious. The traditional Home Office approach is to comb through a person's interviews and statements looking for inconsistencies in the account. For example, sometimes people are disbelieved because they've been inconsistent about the date something happened, or the order something happened or how many times it happened. Sometimes they're disbelieved because the official doesn't think their account sounds plausible, and so on. Time after time, people are disbelieved and refused asylum. And then on appeal, they're cross-examined and accused of lying about the worst events in their lives, which is deeply re-traumatizing. Now, the worst of it is that this is a completely spurious way of assessing credibility, because decades of psychological evidence shows us that human memory for temporal information such as dates, durations, and sequences, is very poor. So is human memory for proper names and peripheral details. Furthermore, many asylum seekers have been through traumatic events and suffer from conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. These conditions can cause overgeneral memory, making it more difficult to describe specific events in one's past. 
Studies have consistently shown that truthful accounts of traumatic events are usually internally inconsistent. In fact, there are just as many inconsistencies in true accounts as in false ones. And studies have also shown that judges and other decision makers are very bad at assessing whether a person is truthful. They often think they can, and in reality they can't. So in short, when people are disbelieved and refused asylum by the Home Office, it's almost always for spurious reasons. Assessing credibility is a guessing game. Whether an asylum seeker ends up getting asylum is largely a lottery. It often depends on whether their appeal is heard by a friendly judge or a hostile one, and sadly on how good their lawyer is. And for many traumatised asylum seekers, the asylum process is a process of re-traumatisation, where they're accused of lying about the most terrible events of their lives. The consequences of refusal are terrible. Sometimes it means detention and enforced removal. Sometimes it means long-term street homelessness and destitution with no right to work or claim benefits. Sometimes it means being driven into the hands of human traffickers. So when you see the Home Office saying, oh, well, refused asylum seekers should leave the country, just remember that many of those people are, in fact, at risk of persecution and have been wrongly disbelieved. Finally, I'm going to talk about Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which protects the right to private and family life. Most of us would be horrified if we were permanently separated from our families and our loved ones. But the immigration system inflicts this on people every day. Article 8 protects the right to private and family life, but Article 8 is a qualified right, not an absolute right. It can be restricted in the public interest. And in recent years, courts have been extremely deferential to the government in allowing it to restrict Article 8 rights. Both the Labour and Conservative governments have ripped families apart in the name of immigration control, while the courts rubber stamp their cruelty. In 2012, Theresa May, as Home Secretary, introduced a new financial requirement for British citizens and people settled in the UK who wanted to sponsor a foreign spouse or partner to come here and live with them. The British or settled partner has to be earning at least £18,600 a year. If the foreign partner has children, the financial requirement is even higher. There has been a lot of litigation about this, and in the case of MM Lebanon, the financial requirement was challenged on Article 8 grounds. The Supreme Court ultimately upheld the financial requirement, but carved out some clearer exceptions to it. But the financial requirement still keeps many families apart. Obviously, it impacts poorer families. It has a disproportionate impact on racial minorities and marginalised groups. And that's not the only way that the immigration system destroys families. I also want to talk about deportation. In general, if you're a foreign national who commits a crime for which you get at least 12 months imprisonment, you will be automatically considered for deportation under the UK Borders Act 2007, introduced by the then Labour government. I should explain that deportation is a term of art in British immigration law, so we distinguish removal, which is normally in cases not involving criminality, from deportation, which is normally in cases involving criminality. Um, most, most people use deportation in everyday speech to mean both, but... Uh, but they're, they're technical terms in immigration law. So, um, but essentially, you, you can be, you'll be considered for automatic deportation if you've got a 12-plus month sentence, even if you've lived in the UK since early childhood, and don't even remember your home country or speak the language. In fact, there was a recent Court of Appeal case where the Home Office was seeking to deport a young man, Remy Akinyemi, who was born in the UK. As Leslie explained earlier, not everyone who is born in the UK is a British citizen. And under the coalition government, things got dramatically worse. Theresa May's Immigration Act 2014 introduced the new sections 117A to D, which attempted to codify judges' consideration of Article 8 in immigration cases. They particularly constrained the freedom of judges to decide deportation appeals and tightened the rules on when you could resist deportation on the basis of your private and family life in the UK. Even if you have a British partner and a British child, this is not necessarily enough. If your sentence was less than four years and you're relying on your relationship with your British partner or child, Section 117C requires you to show that the impact of your deportation on your British partner and child will be unduly harsh, which is a high threshold. Not enough to show that it will be harsh, it has to be unduly harsh. If your sentence was four years or more, you have to show very compelling circumstances, which is an even higher threshold. Time after time in the last few years, courts deciding deportation appeals have ruled that British children should be permanently separated from their parents, despite evidence that the loss of a parent will cause irreparable emotional and developmental harm to the child. 
Now again, ask yourself how this would feel if this happened to your own family. Not everyone who faces deportation has committed some horrible crime. Some people get 12-month sentences just for using a false passport out of desperation to find work and feed their family. Many people who face deportation are British in all but name and have lived here most of their lives. Many have British partners and British children. Ask yourself whether this is really just. So today, uh, again, this has been a whistle-stop tour, and we've only scratched the surface of the cruelty meted out by the immigration system. There are many things we don't have time to cover. These include, for example, the government's increasing use of draconian powers to deprive people of their nationality, and the rubber stamping of these decisions by the courts. Another thing we don't have time to cover in any depth is the UK's broken and inadequate system for protecting victims of trafficking and modern slavery, and the cynical way that the Home Office claims to protect trafficking victims while creating the conditions that drive them back into the hands of traffickers. But suffice it to say that the immigration system is a brutal Kafkaesque edifice of cruelty from the bottom to the top. I now want to hand over to Leslie for some concluding thoughts about the politics and policy of immigration. I want to examine two of the most common arguments for immigration controls to see whether or not those arguments stack up. The first and strongest argument for immigration controls is this. People say that if Britain opened its borders to unlimited immigration, it would be overwhelmed. It wouldn't have enough housing or enough schools and hospitals, or enough jobs. After all, we live in a world where there are many disasters and crises that are happening, and where many people are displaced, and it's only going to get worse, particularly as the climate changes. Is that right? How do these arguments stack up? You just need to look at the crisis that we're in today in terms of not having enough drivers, not having enough people to staff our hospitals, not having enough people to pick our food, food in the ground rotten. You see, we have to put this in context, don't we? Rapid mass movements of people from one place to another are already happening. But they are happening in countries which are a lot poorer than in the UK and much less equipped to deal with them. For example, Lebanon, a much smaller and poorer country than the UK, hosts 1.5 million Syrian refugees and Afghanistan and Iraq, both countries we have invaded, faced internal displacement on a huge scale. Right now, with the Taliban takeover in, in Afghanistan, neighboring countries are expecting large numbers of refugees. You see, by closing our borders, therefore, we don't solve the problem. We simply push it onto countries that are poorer than we are, that have much less infrastructure than we have, and are much less equipped to respond. Therefore, this particular argument for closed borders amounts to a kind of nimbyism, not in my backyard. It amounts to saying that as long as we, British, can maintain our high standard of living, it doesn't matter what happens to the rest of the world. I personally do not think that is legitimate or ethical. The second restrictionist argument we often hear about is the character of the individual immigrants. People justify immigration controls often like to distinguish between good immigrants and bad immigrants. For example, when a person who is not a British citizen commits a serious crime, the right-wing press often clamours for them to be deported 
and the Home Office often fights in courts for them to be deported. The argument we hear is that governments should protect the British public from serious crime, deporting people who commit it. The people who make this argument often argue that people who commit crimes have abused the hospitality of the UK. But may I suggest this argument isn't convincing for three reasons. First, let's remember that nationality is arbitrary. As I said earlier, nationality is an accident of birth. It depends on when you were born, where you were born, and who your parents are. Suppose that a British citizen and a non-citizen non commit the same crime. The British citizen is punished only once, but the non-citizen is punished twice. Once by their criminal sentence, and a second time by their deportation. Is that justice? And if the person is really a danger to the public, why does the protection of the British public matter more than the protection of the public in the person's home country? Second, many people who are deported have lived in the UK since early childhood and have little or no memory of their home countries. They are, in effect, products of our society. We made them. Many have put down roots here with British partners, have British children. And as David said, there are even examples of deportation cases against people who were born in the UK. Many of these people are foreign in name only and are British in all but name. Yet their paper nationality is all that matters to the Home Office. Third, we also need to remember that people who commit crimes, even serious crimes, are human. And some may argue, rather than punishing people through deportation, we would do a far better job at keeping the public safe if we invested in measures that prevent crime in the first place, such as jobs, housing, education, drug addiction treatment, and strong and empowered communities. Ultimately, trying to, to label people as good immigrants or bad immigrants is insulting. All of us, native-born citizens and immigrants alike, are human beings. We all deserve equal rights. Shouldn't we work together to build a country, a world, where everyone is welcomed? So the first question that we have is, with the Asylum and Immigration Bill, the restriction on schools teaching about institutional racism, obvious racist components to the Brexit policy, etc., where will international courts become involved? We have the egregious example of the Home Office proposal to temporarily allow entry to drivers who will immediately be rounded on the 24th of December. Well, first of all, if, if the question is about um, the, the relevance of international courts, well, there's a great many international courts that do a great many different things. The Strasbourg Court has had an immense impact on our immigration law um, for, for decades. Um, the, many of the developments I've outlined in the lecture, particularly with regard to Article 3, uh, were the result of Strasbourg case law. You had the case of, of Suring and Chahal, um, case of Suring and Chahal um, a, a few decades ago. And, of course, we talked about the case of Papashvili, which has significantly widened the protection available to seriously ill people uh, facing removal. We also talked all the way back in 1973 about the East African Asians case, where the Strasbourg Court... Uh, pointed out uh, 
in, in, in uncharacteristically strong terms the, uh, the, the racist nature of the 1968 Act. Um, so um, certainly the Strasbourg Court has had an outsized influence on our immigration law. It's often very timid. It often doesn't go anywhere near as far as it, as it should do. And it often, unfortunately, legitimises fairly um, extreme immigration restrictions. Um, but it's, it's, it's still... Um, I think in terms of the impact of other international courts, it's, it's, it's pretty minimal on our immigration law. Um, we, we, you know, people, it, it's not unheard of for people to make individual complaints to the Human Rights Committee or, or whatever, but it's not, they, they play quite a marginal role in our immigration law. And of course, many of the other human rights treaties that we're signed up to are unincorporated, so they're not directly a part mm. of our domestic law. May I come in? I, I, I think, it's particularly on the first part of the question, the answer doesn't just lie with the law or with courts. It's interesting, the first part of that question, when it, was to, when it made reference to um, trying to control, uh, it, particularly in schools, what is taught. And I think the obligation is on um, political parties, opposition, and on each and every one of us. You see, I refuse to be gaslit. I refuse to acknowledge that I'm living in a country and I'm told, but Leslie, there is no institutional racism. That's a figment of your imagination. I, I'm sorry, but you know, when you walk in my shoes and um, take the steps that I take every day, and when your eyes are open to just looking at the statistics, and the statistics speak for themselves, you just need to look at, and by the way, these are not my statistics, these are government statistics. So just take the Lamy review in 2017 and you look at the disproportionate impact that um, uh, the criminal justice system has had on black people and Asian people. Um, you know, I refuse to sit back and I will use every platform I can to say, do not tell me there is no such thing as institutional racism it exists. So it's not just a matter to be left to courts. I think we all ha have an obligation to call, th call this out. Thank you. Um, one more from, on from the online audience. This is a question for Professor Thomas. What are the key differences between the two types of passports for UK citizens and UK CKs? I'm the, uh, can I hand that over to David, because this is David's area. Okay, so, so um, it, 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 essentially, the, uh, un, under the 1962 Act, you, you, had, uh, um, you, you essentially had controls applied not to CUKCs who had a CUKC passport that was issued in the UK by the Secretary of State in the UK, but controls were applied to, uh, controls were applied to people, to CUKCs who had a passport issued by the governor of a British colony. So if you had a... CUKC passport, if you were a CUKC and your passport was issued by the governor of Hong Kong or the governor of Montserrat or whatever, you were, you, you, you were subject to controls, whereas if it was issued by the Secretary of State in London, then you weren't. It was a rather bizarre way of, um, way of distinguishing the two. It didn't make a great deal of sense. Um, and uh, that was then replaced in the 68 Act, as we've heard um, early on in the lecture, with, with the system based on, based on UK ancestry ties to the UK. And, and, and the, the thing to note is, um, as is the title of this um, lecture, it disproportionately impacted people of colour. That's the point. Shall we take some questions from yeah. the floor? Any questions from the floor? I believe there's one at the back there. Parliament, Parliament is sovereign. The courts are subservient to Parliament. Therefore, whatever the law is passed will, are, are paramount. Yeah. And the courts even so. Yes. But there are some laws that are inexplicable. And even when they go to, go to European Human Rights, they sign majority decisions. I believe those majority decisions are based on the sovereignty of Parliament, not the evidence. I have concerns. The advocacy before the European Human Rights is questionable. But I can't get the statements made by advocates in European Human Rights. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's certainly true that the... Uh, 
the, the, the sovereignty of Parliament and the concomitant fact that we don't have constitutionally entrenched rights in the true sense is a real problem for the protection of rights in the UK. Ultimately, as we've seen time and time again in immigration law, and if we had more time, we could go through a large number of examples, we've seen time and time again Parliament legislating to, 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 to take away rights, to restrict rights, um, and, and, and this is, it's constrained to a degree by the courts. An example of the courts constraining it to a degree is the recent Privacy International case in the Supreme Court, where, uh, where the courts kind of read down a clause that ousted judicial review of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. But this is all kind of, as you say, these are ways that the, the, the courts sometimes have to work around parliamentary sovereignty, which ultimately you know, allows Parliament in the end to do whatever it likes and to take away our rights whenever it likes. Um, the Human Rights Act, which we, we've alluded to in this lecture and, and Leslie's covered in, in great depth in his, in his previous lecture series, um, is, uh, um, is, is another important constraint. But again, as you say, it's ultimately, it's ultimately subservient to the, the sovereignty of Parliament. And there have been cases, of course, of, of Parliament simply ignoring Strasbourg judgments, such as over prisoner voting, where they simply... Uh, they, they, they got a result they didn't like in Strasbourg and they've simply refused to implement it and prisoners still can't vote. One more question. From this gentleman. Um, thank you very much. That's an amazing speech. Um, if we look at the section 117 of A to D of the Immigration Act 2014 and the rights of families to be together, especially where you've got British uh, people who are technically foreign nationals, who are being deported, even though they've got British children and British partners. Um, if we look at that within, it, as a student of law, I'm completely confused to some extent, no, I know it shouldn't be, uh, where Children's Act 1989, the welfare of the child, the paramount importance, is being totally negated. And can anyone think of a more racist example of that than the treatment of the vulnerable teenager, Shamega Bacon, and the death of her three British babies. Yeah. I think that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the thing is with section 117C is it, it, it imposes this threshold, these thresholds of unduly harsh and very compelling circumstances in relation to children, which explicitly impose a threshold higher than, than simple harshness. And the, the best interests of the child has been a feature of our immigration law since the seminal 2011 case of... ZH Tanzania. But you're absolutely right that section 117C in the context of deportation very significantly constrains that. There are innumerable cases where courts have accepted that the impact of deportation on the child would be harsh, but not unduly harsh. So they can sacrifice the child's, they can sacrifice the child's interest, the child's welfare, the child's emotional development on the altar of immigration controls and on the altar of the the, the deportation of foreign, foreign criminals. So it, it, it's... Sorry, can I ask, you know, um, David, you've done many more of these cases than I have. In terms of how the courts go about looking at unduly, uh, it seems to me to be a fairly subjective, um, immovable um, um, object. Yes. Well, interestingly, that was something that, uh, that 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 was something that there was a lot of litigation about because initially the courts had said, well, um, it, you you kind of balance the child's interests against the seriousness or otherwise of the parent's criminality. And then the Supreme Court in KO Nigeria said, no, you don't, it's a fixed threshold. Um, it's a fixed threshold that applies like if your sentence was less than four years. If it's above four years, it's very compelling circumstances. But you're, you're right, it is, it is a high threshold. Um, and th there are innumerable cases where, you know, I think particularly if you look at the jurisprudence of the Court of Appeal over the last few years, it's incredibly harsh. Most people lose. Sometimes you get people who've, who've lost, you know, people with, with serious criminal convictions, most of them lose. You've got people who have won in the first tier in the upper tribunal and then lost in the Court of Appeal. It's, it's, it's an, in, in, an incredibly harsh area of case law and it really is sacrificing the welfare and needs and development of British children on the altar of immigration controls. It's putting, it's putting the state first, not the child first. Mm -hmm. and, and the best interest principle has become lip service in, in recent years in our, in our case law. I think we do need to draw it to a close there. I would like to thank both of our speakers and ask you to join me in thanking them. Thank